Hello, everyone. Welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our preparatory ground instruction for exercise 18, approach and landing. You should have read through your flight training manual on uh, this exercise prior uh, to this lesson. We're going to talk about the different types of landings. And uh, it's obviously important because, well, we want to land every flight. Uh, there's nothing like taking off without knowing how to land, which unfortunately I've seen some people try to do and try to teach themselves to fly. Takeoff's pretty easy. Landing's pretty hard, and uh, they unfortunately get stuck in the air for a little bit until they are forced to land by low fuel. So please, please don't ever do that. So let's get started. So let's begin with a normal landing. So as we talked about with normal takeoffs, reference your pilot operating handbook. It has fantastic information on how to uh, do some of these maneuvers, and so normal landing is one of them. So in a typical Cessna, you're going to approach at 60 to 70 knots indicated airspeed with full flap. Above, uh, uh, when you're about 10 feet high, or let's say you're above the run or over the runway, you're going to pull the power to idle. At 10 feet, which is about the height of the windsock, you're going to slowly raise the nose. You're going to attempt to hold the aircraft two feet off the ground or so by smoothly applying back pressure and maintain runway center line using ailerons and rudder. So, sounds simple. However, this is the exercise that most students have the hardest time mastering. Usually they get started in their training, they get through a couple lessons uh, or a couple exercises each flight. So let's just say they do steep turns and slow flight and maybe even stalls in one flight. And they're like, wow, I'm doing really well. And they're taking off and the takeoffs go well and the circuits go well. And then they try to land and then it's really hard. And they all they do is takeoffs and landings for like 10 hours. And so if you're in that uh, situation, don't despair. That's like it happens to everybody. And there's a number of reasons for it. And that's just unfortunately the way it is because it's easy to do a descent uh, when there's nothing to hit. But now when we have to land, uh, like it's pretty precise, we have to land on the runway. Uh, if we flare, uh, we, we have to flare at the correct altitude. So what typically happens is students end up ballooning a lot of times. Uh, they see the ground coming at them. They kind of freak out. They pull up suddenly all of a sudden, but they were too fast. So what I say is that just fly the airplane and just fly it two feet off the ground with the power idle. And then as you start descending, don't pull back, but just apply back pressure. Just pull, like apply back pressure back and really be patient. And so when I'm coaching somebody to land, I'll often be like, you hold it there, be patient, be patient, hold it off, hold it off, hold it off, be patient. And I'll say that for about 10, 15, 10 seconds or so. And then they touch down, they make a good landing because often they're they're too impatient. They just want to let the airplane hit the runway and then it ends up hitting the nose gear. So that's how to do it. It sounds easy uh, and and you'll find once you're flying, it's actually a lot more difficult than I explained, but that's, that's how to do a normal landing. So let's take a look. I'm just going to demonstrate on this video uh, how a normal landing will look like. Here we are approaching for a normal landing. When you fly over the threshold, reduce the power to idle. At approximately 10 feet, attempt to level off the aircraft and hold the altitude constant at about two feet. As you start to descend, just continuously pull back on the controls and attempt to maintain uh, two feet above the runway. Touch down with the main wheels first. Once you're on the runway, maintain the runway center line and then you can exit at the first available exit. Once you're stopped, you can complete your after landing checklist. So like we discussed uh, in the takeoffs, you have your normal takeoff and landing, and then we have five different types of variations. And so what the way I teach it is a, same as takeoffs. Everything's the same for all these specialty takeoffs and landings, and uh, except you, you make a few changes. And so you if you, um, all of the different types of specialty takeoffs and landings are covered in uh, this 
video. But if you haven't got there yet, you can pause here and take a look at this uh, sometime later when, you, when you're at this point in your training, because the first bunch of landings are just normal takeoffs and landings. And when you master the, uh, those, then you get into what we call the specialty takeoffs and landings. So for a crosswind landing, you're going to approach same speed, but only 20 degrees of flap. You're going to maintain the runway center line using the ailerons and use the rudder to remain straight. So landing's the same so far, except 20 degrees of flap and just remain straight using your rudder and ailerons. And then on touchdown, you're going to keep those control inputs in and you're gonna to touch down on the upwind wheel and then you set down to the downwind wheel and then the nose gear. And this might sound a bit tricky, but really it's just combining your normal landing, which you've already learned, and your side slip, which you learned earlier in your training. So when you combine the two, you end up with your crosswind landing. And the truth is, if you can nail a crosswind landing, you can just make really beautiful landings. And usually you impress your passengers quite a bit because you end up touching down your upwind wheel and you just hold it and you just ride this airplane on the upwind wheel before putting the other one down. And I'll just throw in this too. Uh, if you ever get to fly like a heavy, heavy jet, you can end up making crosswind landings that are way smoother than uh, normal landings. And the reason for that is the, let's say on like a 737, uh, when the, there's a squat switch on the landing gear, on the right gear, that when it senses the right gear has collapsed, the ground lift dump spoilers uh, activate. So those are the spoilers that really make sure you're on the ground so that you have maximum braking. And if you can hold that wheel off the runway, those ground lift dump spoilers don't activate. So it doesn't kind of do that last little boom and kind of set you down on the runway. So you can make these like really nice landings, especially if it's wet out um, and then the spoilers don't deploy right away. And you're supposed to deploy them manually, but if you deploy them manually, you can do a bit slower. So that has absolutely nothing to do with your training. So forgive me for my kind of divergence, but I just thought I'd throw it in there. So let's watch this video here of a crosswind landing and just kind of take a look at the attitude on touchdown, how it's, it's kind of in a banked attitude. This is a crosswind landing. Maintain the center line by keeping your wing into the wind and maintain a straight flight using your rudder. Touch down with your upwind wheel first, so your upwind wing will be down. Maintain the center line after you touch down. Let's talk about a soft field landing, same as a short, uh, sorry, as a normal landing. What you're gonna do is just leave on a little bit of power, 100 or 200 RPM. You're going to touch down in a, in a more nose high attitude. So you wanna get keep that nose gear off the ground. And uh, after you touch down, keep that weight off the nose gear. So after you touch down, just pull the controls all the way back and really minimize the amount of weight that's on that nose gear. Because it is possible on a soft field that that nose gear, if there's too much force on it, it digs in and collapses and flips you over. So uh, we'll take a look. This is how a soft field landing uh, looks like. This is a soft field landing. To conduct a soft field landing, do it just like you would a normal landing but leave about 100 or 200 RPM on. Touch down in a nose high attitude. After touchdown, bring the controls all the way back and attempt to keep the nose wheel off the ground as long as possible. Okay, let's uh, talk about a short field landing. So obviously a short field landing, we're landing somewhere where the runway is, uh, well, short. So it's the same as a normal landing. Uh, but first off, we approach at, a, the, at the recommended speed. So take a look at your pilot operating handbook. The uh, Cessna 150 calls for a speed of 52 knots. So you're going to apply full flap, 52 knots. And this is kind of the important point. You're going to, you're pick, going to pick, up, pick out three points on the runway. So take a look at the runway and pick your touchdown point. Okay, and your touchdown point will usually be kind of right after the beginning of the runway. Then you're going to pick a flare point. This flare point is going to be three to 500 feet prior to the touchdown point. And this is where you're aiming uh, on the approach. So you're aiming for this flare point, and then you're also gonna have a go around point. That's where in your mind, if I'm not touched down by this go around point, I'm going to go around. So this will be, if you touch down after that point, if you apply maximum braking, you're not stopped. 
Okay, so you have three points, your touchdown point, your flare point, and your go-around point. And so you aim for your touchdown point, or sorry, you aim uh, for your flare point. At your flare point, you're going to reduce the power, and you're going to hopefully touch down at your touchdown point. If you find yourself that you think you're going to touch down before your touchdown point, uh, then you can always add a little bit of power if you need to, to kind of help you make it. But you should be able to plan this out so you touch down exactly where you where you want. And then when you're on uh, when you've touched down, you apply full brakes, obviously. So I'm going to touch on something else. It's going to be somewhat controversial because um, a lot of instructors, and I was taught this when I was starting out, uh, teach and pilots do is like they say, okay, when you touch down, put your flaps up right away and put full brakes on. And the rationale that they use is that it reduces uh, or uh, decreases the lift on the wing. And so because you have less lift on the wing, you have more weight on the wheels, more braking power, therefore shorter stopping distance. And so that is true in theory. And that's the way I used to teach it as well. And, and I suspect a lot of instructors do, but I've completely changed my mind. And I think that's a really dumb thing to do. And I'll, like, I'll explain it to you. And if you don't agree, fine. Uh, but first off, this technique assumes uh, that you're going to suddenly raise the flaps and reduce this distance. If that's what it takes for you to stop, you're probably in a, in a strip that is too short because it's only going to reduce the distance by like 10, 20 feet. And if that's what it is, you probably shouldn't be landing there. Second of all, it's a bad habit to get into. Uh, you might This might work in a Cessna 150, but if you start flying a retractable gear airplane and you start flicking switches while you're still going down the runway, one of these days you're going to do it in your Piper Aztec or your arrow or Cessna 310 and you're going to hit the wrong switch and you're going to accidentally retract your gear. Now you might say oh, like oh yeah but you know there's safety mechanisms and yeah there are there's squat switches that prevent that from happening but they do fail and so it'd be an awfully dumb habit to get into and find yourself that you've raised your landing gear on roller and as a matter of fact in a lot of uh, standard operating procedures in large airlines they actually direct you you don't touch anything and you're clear of the runway or you're slowed down to taxi speed and the captain directs you. So for exactly this reason, you don't want to start hitting things. And the last thing is, this again might work on a Cessna 150, but I, I fly a Cetabria, which is a tail dragger and the flap lever is slightly different. Your landing is not done until you are at uh, a walking speed or stopped. And so you try to do this with a tail dragger and raising the flaps and all of a sudden you reach down to grab the flap lever, drop the flaps, and before you know it, you've either ground looped the airplane or flipped it over. So these are all these things that can happen by raising the flaps just so you can shorten your landing distances a little bit. So if you want to do this and you're uh, competing in some short landing, spot landing competition in Valdez, Alaska, go ahead. But in this case, the way I see it, there's just an increase in risk without any real benefit to it. So I don't do this. I don't encourage other people to do it. And you can discuss with your instructor uh, whether you, you want to do this or not, but I don't do it. There's a lot of little tricks that I know to increase performance on an airplane, um, and I don't do it, uh, or I, couldn't, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes I do it because it's fun. And, I, and I'm trying to improve my performance and, and, and doing that like that. But I would never tell a student to do it. Uh, you can watch the short landing competitions in Alaska. They're really cool. You know, you have these guys come in with full flaps, these tricked out super cubs, full power. They're essentially stalled. And then the last minute, they just chop the power and the plane just falls out of the sky. Um, and it's cool to watch. And unfortunately, every year, somebody flips their airplane around or does something and damages their airplane. So, I mean, if you want to fly like that, uh, I, I never fly that aggressively, by the way, but I certainly don't tell students to do this. So it's up to you. It's up to your instructor how you exactly want to do this, but I, I discourage it. So let's watch a video how a short field landing looks like, and, uh, and you'll see, and I'll talk your way through it. This is a short field landing with no obstacle. Pick a touchdown point, an aim point, and a go around point. Aim for your aim point, 
Once there, reduce the power and aim to touch down at your touchdown point. After touchdown, apply full brakes. Lastly, let's talk about an obstacle uh, clearance landing. So it's the same as a normal landing, but you're going to approach at the recommended speed. The whole idea behind the obstacle landing is you want to have a constant angle over the obstacle. So don't find yourself leveled off at a lot of power, essentially in slow flight, full flap, and then once you um, clear the obstacle, just chopping the power. You want to just have a, a nice, smooth, uh, constant descent angle. Once you clear the obstacle, you can slowly reduce the power, and on touchdown, you're going to apply full brakes. If you chop the power once you clear the obstacle, there's a good chance that what will happen, because you're so slow, you won't have enough airflow over your horizontal stabilizer. When you go to flare, uh, the aircraft won't flare terribly well, and you'll find yourself with uh, an awfully hard touchdown. So that's why I say just reduce that, that power slowly. So here's a video uh, landing over a obstacle, and yeah, you can see how it looks like. This is an obstacle clearance landing. Attempt to cross the obstacle at approach speed and full flaps. Once clear of the obstacle, slowly reduce the power to idle and touch down as close as possible to the obstacle. Apply full brakes. Let's talk about an overshoot. An overshoot is uh, also known as a balked landing or balked approach, a go around. It all kind of means the same thing. It means uh, you're abandoning your landing. And this exercise is really important uh, for you to get proficient at because all too often we want to save our pride. We're about to make a bad landing and we save the bad landing and we pat ourselves on the back. Hey, look how good I am. I saved this bad landing. Really what you should be doing is going around uh, and, and and coming back a second time because you could find yourself uh, completely out of uh, position. So these are necessary when the landing can no longer be safely accomplished. Air traffic control tells you to pull up and go around or you're out of position for landing, you bounce or balloon. So to the procedure for an overshoot, you're going to apply full power, carburetor heat cold, and put your flaps to 20. And again, this is in a Cessna 172 or Cessna 150. You're going to pitch and accelerate to the normal climb speed. So this might be anywhere from leveling off or a normal climb, depending on the speed at which the overshoot happened. You fi might find yourself in slow flight and you just have to level off and recover from slow flight. And then you're gonna raise the flaps progressively uh, after 20 degrees. So let's take a video or uh, watch a video on, on how an overshoot uh, looks like. This is from a, a low uh, altitude. In, uh, on landing, we could have some visual illusions depending on how the runway will look like. So. Uh, first off, if we have an upslope or downslope runway, we can increase or decrease our landing distances and take off by 5%. Uh, but if we have an upslope uh, runway, it could make it look like we are too high and the result is a low approach. Conversely, a downslope runway makes it look like we're too low and the result is a low approach. So just take a look at these diagrams and hopefully that makes sense to you. And uh, you will find this, uh, it, it's, it definitely throws you off even, I mean, I've flown for years and there are some uh, runways that are like this. Uh, Las Vegas um, is like this on, on some runways and, uh, it, and it's not much, uh, but it, it throws you, it really throws you for a loop and uh, can, you can end up floating down the runway quite a bit or making a hard landing. Let's talk about some common landing problems. The first one's a bounce. So the bounce is caused by an insufficient flare. The pilot kind of flares, but then just kind of gives up. It's a hard landing. So the solution is going around. Balloon, sometimes that's caused by the opposite. The flare is too aggressive. The pilot uh, just kind of sees the ground, kind of freaks out of it, pulls back, and all of a sudden finds himself back 30 feet in the air at a very low speed. And the solution is going around. And sometimes what you can do is just add a little bit of power if it's just like a really small balloon, like five feet or so. But for most cases, you want to go around. And then uh, lastly, we have wheelbarrow. These are really rare. I never really see students do that. Um, and that's caused by too much forward pressure. So the solution is back elevator. So the important thing to remember is never attempt to save a landing by pushing forward. 
Okay, that that's the number one thing. The other thing too is generally go around if uh, if you're going to make a bad landing. So here's just a picture here of 737, uh, and this happened. Somebody tried to save a bad landing by pushing forward, wrinkled the fuselage, and you can see all those wrinkles. Well, that airplane's a write-off. Um, it's going into uh, they're going to make pop cans out of it. Talk about landing performance. So same as takeoff performance. Hopefully you have this figured out. We can take a look at our conditions here. Okay, condition. We can take a look at our notes. What we do with headwinds, uh, gr dry grass runway. So let's say we're 20 degrees out. It's 2,000 feet, and we're gross weight. Ground roll 490 feet, takeoff distance 1140. So that should be pretty basic to you now. Just to give yourself plenty of practice, regularly go through your POH. Just be familiar with how uh, how to calculate that. You can get more information on it in your uh, in your ground school. Let's review uh, wake turbulence. Remember, it's always the pilot's responsibility. You want to maintain uh, wait a minimum of two minutes behind a medium or four minutes a heavy, and approach high and touch down above the touchdown point. Talk about the flight test standards. So you're going to be expected to demonstrate a normal landing, a short field, or a soft field landing, and an overshoot. So uh, the one thing that's kind of changed in the last few years is uh, it's expected that you land with full flaps. Also, just basic uh, airmanship things. You're going to review passenger safety briefing. You're going to select the touchdown point, uh, maintain an adequate approach speed, control uh, your uh, track with respect to crosswind, touchdown uh, smoothly uh, within the touchdown zone, and apply brakes as appropriate. The short field landing, same sort of thing. Uh, follow the manufacturer's direction and you're going to have to touch down within 200 feet of uh, where you said you were going to uh, touch down. The soft field landing, same basic thing, uh, but this time it's not so important where you touch down, but they say the first third of the runway surface, uh, but everything else is pretty much the same. And keep in mind, you're going to have to keep that nose wheel off the ground as long as possible. So you're going to touch down and just keep that nose wheel or the uh, stick back and uh, for the soft field uh, landing. Lastly, for the overshoot, uh, you're going to be asked to overshoot on command. So you're promptly going to apply max power and uh, go to the pitch attitude, track the flaps on stages and climb up. It's pretty simple to do. Just get, uh, just get practice and just be prepared for that. So that concludes this lesson on the approach and landing. Uh, thanks for joining me.